So let's start with our topic, functional Bible translation, or what about functions in Bible translation? I, I'm telling you about the project I realized together with my husband. Um, the book was published in 1999 uh, on the occasion of the 100th birthday of the publishing house. And this was more or less um, the brief. They wanted a new Bible translation to celebrate. Hmm? And this is not really a theological publisher, but they have literature, and so it's Zurkamp in, in Frankfurt, but a very traditional um, publishing house. And um, the whole um, project lasted from 1993 to 99. Uh, at, in the beginning, we thought we had so much time that sometimes we spent um, a whole day just one verse <laughs> and a long um, walk uh, along the beach in our holiday place at our holiday place on an island in the North Sea. And when we came home, we had just one verse. And um, after two or three years, the publisher sort of pressed uh, and said, yeah, but in 99, it should be ready and published. OK, what is different uh, in this uh, project um, co as compared to other Bible translations into German. There are about 50 um, other earlier Bible translations and one or later one which is a feminist Bible translation which came out <coughs> last year uh, at the Frankfurt Book Fair. Now one um, difference is the, uh, the amount of text included because apart from the canonical text, which you find in every New Testament, we included non-canonical texts, which might have been included in the canon had they been known and or wanted uh, at the time when the canon was formed, which is not well known. Uh, you don't, we don't know it exactly. We just uh, theolog uh, theologians suppose it was around 200 and maybe it was in Rome but that's not sure um, and so we wanted to reconstruct the repertoire from which the um, the people who composed the canon and we don't know about them either uh, would have chosen uh, some of the texts uh, were not available to, to them so one couldn't say they didn't want them because they were, were found in the 19th century somewhere in the sands of Egypt or uh, in some old library like in Nakamadi, for example. And uh, we could uh, we could suppose that uh, the people composing the canon didn't know them at the time. But other uh, texts were known and they were rejected. And certain texts which now form our canon were included, but there are different canons for different communities, different churches, so this is for sure that there is not only one canon, and some of our apocrypha, that is non-canonical texts, are canonical in other churches, in the Orthodox Church and so on. So we included all the texts that were um, produced, that can be believed to, be, to have been produced um, before 200 and which are primary texts of the text types such as gospels or letters, not secondary texts, commenting on etc. Um, and so this is uh, the text type is one criterion and the time of production is another one. Um, so comparing proportions, one third of the book is the canon and two-thirds is non-canonical texts, early Christian writings, and the, the publisher um, promotes the book saying this is 
all the early Christian, all the earliest Christian texts we have. Okay, uh, my husband really uh, was in um, was fond of exhaustivity, and even shortly before t uh, finishing the project, he found some fragments somewhere. And I said, "Oh, please, <laughs> couldn't you just pretend you have never seen them?" No, he can't. No, this is. Uh, the scholarly aspect, and they had to go into it, and they had to be translated. And now the, the new um, edition they're preparing, or they have, been, have prepared already, will include the, the newly found Gospel of Jude as well, which we translated now. Okay, source languages and cultures. Um, the New Testament was translated from the Greek, using the Novum Testamentum Greke, edited by Neste Alan, that, that is the standard reference edition. Um, the non-canonical texts were in Hebrew, or Latin, or Coptic, or Syriac, or Ethiopic, and Arabic. And especially um, the um, Arabic agrapha, that is non-written words of Jesus, some of them are found in the Quran, um, uh, something uh, which has not been a text which have not been published before in German. The other texts in part have been published before, but they are not available to a broader public. They were published in some specialized journals and, uh, of course, in, uh, in more philological uh, translation, whereas uh, many people tell us that precisely non-canonical texts are interesting, and this is why they bought the book. At least um, the publisher has sold more than 55,000 copies of this book since 99, and I think this is quite nice. It's not really a world bestseller, but uh, I think for such an old book, it's, um, it's a nice number, isn't it? The translator. The translators, we were a team of two, and not sponsored by any church, nor uh, other institution, nor Bible society, etc. Just two private persons, Klaus Berger, professor of New Testament studies at the University of Heidelberg, now emeritus, uh, with occasional excursions to practical work as a pastor during the holidays where he uh, replaced the local pastor <laughs> and uh, did all the, um, um, fulfilled all the tasks a uh, normal pastor had to do and he liked this especially because as a university theologian you sort of saw many lose touch uh, with real world and he sort of is very much interested in not losing this uh, touch and uh, knowing he said, I want to know the end users of my theology and, of course, of our translation as well. Um, in uh, his studies, he was trained in Oriental studies, philosophy, Hebrew, Latin, Greek, Coptic, Syriac, Arabic, etc. So he knows all the source languages. And this was important because he did not want to rely on other people's translations. So we always use the the edition of the text, the, the oldest available. Sometimes you don't know whether it is the original. So I wouldn't talk about originals, but only about source texts, which serve the source for our translation. And my little self, um, trained as a translator in Spanish, English, Portuguese for my um, PhD, uh, Latin at secondary school, uh, and as a mother of children who studied Latin but never uh, really trained in translation from Latin into German. But now, in the meantime, I have uh, some experience with other texts translated from Latin into German and published, and it's usually a Latin that is not classical, not Cicero, Cicero, but it's quite funny. It's nearer to Spanish than to Cicero uh, because it's 11th century uh, Latin. And at first I wondered why I read these texts without any dictionary. And I thought, well, I understand there's no problem with grammar or so. So the, the forms are rather um, like in classical Latin, 
But the semantics have changed a lot, and sometimes I thought I read this text from my knowledge of Spanish more than from my knowledge of Latin. And uh, often I understood them quite in, in quite a different way than my husband did, who knows classical Latin probably much better than I do. Um, but then my uh, reading often seemed the more plausible and coherent one. And that was quite an experience to say, huh, I never knew what Spanish could be <laughs> used for. Uh, so uh, this really makes, yeah, if you, you consider that the first Spanish uh, grammar by Nebrija was um, done, was written in 1492, that's not too far from 11 something. And um, the Spanish language has always been, or by language policy has always been, to refer back to this first grammar when the, the language uh, threatened to sort of go its own way, then people said, oh, no, no, but in De Bricha it's like this, and we have to sort of um, pull the reins. Okay. As functional translators, we had to define the addressees because we've seen. So as I said, the, the publisher didn't really give us an explicit brief, uh, uh, except that it should be a new translation and a different translation, okay? So we had to define, interpret the brief uh, in order to know what, what strategy to choose and uh, to formula, how to formulate our scopus. So first, perhaps it would be wise to say who's not our addressed audience, not theological scholars, um, because we expect them, uh, not always widely so, uh, to know the source languages and cultures uh, to a degree that they would not need a translation, which is not true, because my husband always said that uh, um, the theology students in Germany uh, know better Syriac than Latin or uh, Hebrew or Greek, and Syriac they don't know at all. Um, so um, they would do this, but theological scholars, of course, should refer back to the original text, and not fundamentalists who take the view that only a literal translation can provide a faithful rendering of the substance of the holy original. Mm -hmm. And um, as I told you, you can't guarantee that other people, uh, apart from the addressees, read your text. So it was indeed fundamentalists and theologian, theologians who read our text and criticized it. And the, um, one of the fundamentalists um, left a message on our answering machines, which I, uh, machine, which I already told you about, that we had to await um, to expect eternal hellfire for falsifying the word of God. And the critics in, in the big German papers, usually uh, theological scholars, who criticized our translation because it was not faithful enough. Of course, they didn't read the foreword introduction, which explains what we did for loyalty reasons, what we did, why we did it, and gives some example. But they didn't really think it necessary to read it. But our um, audience, addressed audience, was an audience of lay, lay persons with an interest in the basis of their Christian faith, who very often do not find the existing translations comprehensible, but it is, it is ma mainly people who have already one or more German translations, and they're not satisfied. Um, they don't find answers to their questions there. Especially when read aloud in church, they wouldn't understand the word, they just hear the words and wouldn't understand them because they lack the cultural knowledge of the world to which the texts refer. And I have sometimes acted as lecturer when my husband did the sermon in church in these holiday places and people came afterwards and say, from what translation did you read? I never understood this text before, but it was so nice to understand it. Can this be bought? And say, yes, of course, yeah, uh, this is the reference, uh, this can be bought. And theological mediators, uh, who are no longer familiar enough with the source languages and cultures to be able to prepare their classes, their 
for their sermons using the original texts or a word for word rendering so they might use a word for word uh, interlineal version plus our translation to sort of grasp the contents of the texts.